Civic Action Project is really project-based learning for civics. We have a lot of civics government teachers that are involved in CAP, but we also have English language arts teachers and media specialists, and of late we have science teachers coming into the program too. What it is, it is, as I said, project-based learning. It's housed on its own website, and the address is right there. It's totally free. And CAP has lessons that prepare students to do a project. The lessons are pretty simple to teach. There's only five core lessons. And they are aligned with uh, proven practices in civic learning. So you'll see a lot of interaction among students in those lessons, group work, discussion, collaborative work, some ways that we put students into the roles of decision makers to think about problems. And for students, what they do is they choose an issue that matters to them. Then they connect that issue in some way, shape, or form to public policy. And we give them lots of tools and ways to make that connection. And then they take civic actions to try to make a difference, to impact that selected issue. You'll actually hear about several civic actions that students have taken throughout the course of the webinar. But it's things like petitions, uh, writing letters. Uh, there's a lot of writing involved. Doing interviews, uh, raising awareness, all kinds of different things. And then CAP also has built-in reflection and evaluation for the students to really think about what they did and uh, what impact they made, what they might do next time. So that's really CAP in a nutshell. Why is CRF so lucky? Well, we're lucky because CAP was profiled in a brand new book published by the National Writing Project. Uh, the book is called Uncommonly Good Ideas, Teaching Writing in the Common Core Era. And I have to tell you, uh, this book helped us at CRF really think about CAP and our other programs in whole new ways. It gives us, especially social studies teachers, but I think it's true of, of all the different disciplines. This book and the ideas in it I really, I think, give us permission to do what we really all love to do. Uh, and that is to really engage our students in learning and communicating about what they think, well, and communicating about what they know. With us today, we have Judy Kennedy, Sandy Murphy, and Marianne Smith. Now, Judy is the CAP teacher who was profiled in the book. She teaches at San Lorenzo High School, which is a little bit south of Oakland, a little bit north of San Jose. And she has been doing CAP for three years. She's also been involved in many other things lately, including a lesson study on, on CAP. Sandy is co-author of Uncommonly Good Ideas. And she is deeply familiar with the Common Core since she was a member of the de development team for Common Core. And Marianne, also co-author of the book, works with the National Writing Project. And like Judy and Sandy, well, and me, we've all spent many years in the classroom learning from students how to be a good teacher. So with that, I am going to turn this over to Judy and Sandy and Mary Ann to talk about CAP, civic writing, and Common Core. This is Mary Ann, and I want to tell you all why we wrote about CAP in our book. First but first of all, we're going to find out how many of you have done a CAP project. So we should have a, a a poll here. Actually, let's let's look first at the CAP topics. Um, I'm Judy Kennedy. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, what I love about CAP is that it's inquiry-based and it's aligned with the Common Core. And you can see in front of you um, some of the topics my students now or in the past have chosen. Uh, there, some of them are local. Some of them are um, you know more global. <clears throat> but I really love walking around the classroom and talking to them. I feel like I'm talking to my peers about things that they really, really care about. We want to ask you, however, about your own experience with CAP. Um, we have a little poll here, if you could respond to it. Actually, it looks like it's a survey. OK, there we go. How many of you have done a CAP um, project with students? And how many of you are new to CAP? Yeah, a lot of people are new, um, which is wonderful. It means we might have a really interesting Q&A session. Um, and definitely, if you've already done CAP, we look forward to your contributions on some of the things that you've done before. I'm going to hand it over to Marianne now to talk about uh, 
why they wrote the book. Well, I want to talk about why we put CAP in our book about writing. I got interested in the CAP project by chance. Three years ago, I visited a student showcase event at the Bancroft Hotel, which was right across from the UC Berkeley campus where I work. And I have to tell you, I was hooked right away. There were students from four or five high schools, and they were all presenting their projects. The students were dressed professionally, and they really acted like professionals and experts. They told their personal stories. They told about their research journeys. They detailed their evidence and their findings. And they asked for certain kind of actions. Most of all, they made those of us in the audience really care about their projects. Last year, I came back for more. I came to San Lorenzo High School to watch another showcase event in the school library. And I came away with the same reaction. This is great stuff. So I want to say that we are honored to be among teachers who believe that students need to talk, read, and write in school for real purposes purposes to make sense of the world and to develop as citizens. And we thank you for being here with us this afternoon. Uh, hello, this is Sandy. Um, those of you who have already taught a CAP project already know firsthand how valuable it is for your students. But I think it's always nice to be validated. So I want you to know, being the sort of researcher type in this group, that there are major scholars in the US who say that civic engagement projects are really important in the teaching of writing. Just one example, Rick Beach and his colleagues say that students really need to have authentic purposes and audiences, and they need to write about an issue they care about to try to make real change happen in their world. That description fits the CAP project like a glove. So here's our plan for the time we have together. We'll be looking at the writing opportunities students have when they participate in a CAP project. We'll be talking about how well CAP fits with the Common Core State Standards. And we will be looking at and talking about some really fun student writing samples and a student-produced video. Judy is going to start us off by telling you about the writing opportunities in CAP projects. Hi. <clears throat> so opportunities for writing in CAP are abundant. I, I realized as I was doing this and um, figuring how this aligns with Common Core, what a happy accident that there are so many different ways that students do writing in my classroom for the CAP project. I'm just putting a list in front of you, but analysis, and we're going to go into more detail about some of these um, styles further down the line, but um, in the analysis stage, students make a case for why their CAP topic is so important. Um, today, in fact, in my classroom, I was walking around and students were trying to figure out what their goals were related to their topic. Um, and that, they used the CAP forms to do that, which is really helpful. Terry mentioned that students do interviews and write survey questions, so they have lots of opportunity to, to work on those sorts of things. They write email requests, uh, and they have to make this sort of formal writing um, to, to ask for um, information or someone's time. They've done petitions, which they've circulated on campus. Um, in this case, students wanted class time to start later, so they were trying to get feedback. Uh, letters to elected officials, these are you know, making an argument and asking for a call to action. The reflective piece, we're in my classroom. The reflective piece, um, is one of my favorite pieces because I ask students after each civic action, I ask them, well, what did you learn? You know, um, and, and how is that going to help you with your next civic action? And what did you learn about the process of doing civic action? So they kind of tell a story, but they're also um, putting in the evidence of what they learned. Uh, the final report is a great activity of writing because they take all their learning from multiple sources and they write about their discoveries. And of course, they include some narrative writing in there too. And then there's note taking and scripts and storyboards for PSAs. So we want to do a little chat. Did we miss anything? We're curious, um, what other kinds of writing do your students do in connection with CAP um, if there are some folks that want to share? We have lots of um, multi-genre writing, narrative argument mixed together, different rhetorical purposes for the civic action project. Her students do argumentative projects every quarter. This is a very, very rich, an incredibly rich and useful list. And we could go on for quite a bit about this. Um, but I want to 
I want you to think about this. This is Sandy, by the way. Of all the writing experiences now on our list, how many do you actually think reflect the Common Core state standards? It might surprise you, but the answer is all of them. The standards emphasize that students should learn how to do many different things with writing. In other words, they should, they should demonstrate range. So what do we mean by range of writing? I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what's in the Common Core around this idea of range. Um, one thing that's in this idea of range, that's part of this idea, is that we think students ought to be doing many different kinds of writing for many different purposes. When Marianne and I were teaching, we noticed that many of our secondary students seemed to know how to do one kind of writing, but not another. We worked with students who could tell the story of a football game, but not argue successfully for better helmets or explain a concept. In other words, our students seem to have a limited repertoire. Besides kinds of writing, uh, the standards also say that students need to be able to write in short bursts and in more extended time frames. Why? Well, because writing quickly is sometimes necessary. Students still have to produce impromptu essays for exams, and bosses don't want to wait around for draft number three. Collaboration is another part of range. Students should be able to write by themselves, but they also need to be able to work and write with others, and they like doing it. Judy Kennedy said this about her students collaborating during their, their CAT project, and this was in the computer lab. The kids really worked together. They talked about different kinds of search words, tried to interpret what they were looking at, and shared everything they found. They delegated. You look up this, and I'll look up that. Kids really liked researching together and finding links. They are naturally curious and don't necessarily do this kind of thing every day. And the last one on my list is that it's using technology as a tool for writing. Uh, that's pretty self-evident. We know that you and your colleagues are making thoughtful use of technology in your classroom. All of this about range is a lot for students to, to learn, but the effort's worth it, and it's certainly lined with a common core. So this is Mary Ann, and we're going to take a look at some different kinds of writing experiences that might show up along the way in a CAP project. And just let me say that the Common Core State Standards for Writing in History Social Studies specify two general categories of writing, information and argument. But the standards also identify narrative as an important part of information and argument. And that makes sense to those of us who are interested in CAP projects because personal experience matters in civic action. And often personal experience is where a civic action starts. This is what's going on in my neighborhood or this is what happens every morning on my way to school. So civic action calls for telling your story, and that means putting together your narrative story with academic writing. So now Judy's going to give us one example of where narrative can fit in in a CAP project. Thanks, Marianne. Um, I'm going to read this story about, um, that's written by a student of mine named Jasmine. There's a story behind every CAP project. And Jasmine wrote this um, as her first paragraph of her report at the end of um, the project. And so it goes like this. The issue that I worked on is train track safety. I wanted to make the people more aware of the dangers of walking on the train tracks. I chose to talk about train track safety because I feel the problem of people walking on the train tracks only gets brought up when somebody dies. I feel like we need to discuss train track safety as a community and take action now to prevent the number of deaths from happening. Another reason I chose to work on train track safety is because one of my friends ended up dying from playing on the train track. When my friend Austin Price got struck by an Amtrak train, I was devastated. When he died, I felt like I really didn't do anything to contribute towards his death. When I received the chance to do a project on anything I wanted to do, I figured, why not do train track safety? So I'm spreading awareness about the dangers of walking on the train track and making a tribute to Austin's death at the same time. It's such a powerful narrative that Jasmine's written. 
It, it plays a key role in the whole process of CAP. And not only that, but Jasmine and her teammates had to do a presentation later on, and the students can use this experience of writing their story, their narrative, as a starting point for their presentations. And then when they're presenting, they make a case and they make it more powerful, it's more personal, and they make the audience really care. So we find that this narrative piece of writing, these short writing exercises, build content, meaning, and purpose for what's to come. This is Mary Ann again, and now we want to turn to writing arguments. And I want to say that argument writing is essential to the discipline of social studies, something that you already know. But it's important that there is no one do or die version of argument. One danger with the Common Core State Standards, it might sound like there's a single way to write an argument, but that is so far from reality. So the first point about argument we want to make is take advantage of all the kinds of opportunities for students to make a case to try out some form of argument. And Judy's going to give us an example of just a small piece of writing that makes a case and where students practice argument. Thank you, Miriam. So after the students brainstorm a list of lots of different topics, um, and then they have to rank them according to importance, and we come up as a class for the criteria of importance. After they do that, then individually they pick one of the topics off the list, and they write about why they want to do that topic. They make a case. They argue for why it's important. And so I'm going to read uh, what a student wrote today about the topic of teen depression. The topic of teen depression and suicide is very important because it affects many people on a daily basis. It's a mental disease that slowly takes over people's lives and can lead to self-harm or even suicide. It has become like a common thing amongst teens, which is not okay. Depression also has an impact on education because sometimes that disorder doesn't allow teens to think and focus properly in school. Teen depression and suicide are an epidemic. This is a topic I'm really passionate about because I've had my own experiences with it and I know how bad it can get. Teens with depression need help. Depression can't be ignored. The percentage of depression amongst teens is too high and needs to be lowered. This student writer passionately makes the claim that the topic of teen depression and suicide is very important because it affects many people on a daily basis. Then she follows up with all the reasons why teen depression is truly a problem. When students do this sort of writing, uh, a lot of times they say something's really important, but they don't have specifics. In this case, this, this student is testing out specific reasons, and yeah, there's a hint of narrative, but later on down the line when they have to write these making a case papers later on, they'll include the research, the factual evidence, the stuff that they found out about to make it even more argumentative. Um, Sandy now is going to talk about features of our argument. Yeah, well, so let's take a look at something a little bit more formal than the piece that Judy read. Here's an excerpt from a letter a student wrote to President Obama when he was running for office. It's part of a website collection by the College Board's National Commission on Writing and is co-sponsored by the National Writing Project and Google. When you look at this piece of writing, think about three things. What is the claim? What is the evidence? And is there a call for action? I know skating in gym class may not be an urgent issue with the stock markets falling and the war in Iraq, but please consider these suggestions to the curriculum of physical education in American schools. Imagine if skateboarding were offered in gym class, there would be so many new skills students could learn, like agility, stamina, and balance. I think that skateboarding is a great sport and needs to be included in the physical education curriculum. If you were to learn how to skate, you would have to push a lot, which mimics running, and also if you run a lot, you have more stamina and of course you need balance just to ride a skateboard. According to Skateboard America, skateboarding is the sixth ranked sport in popularity. Kids like it because they think it looks cool. Not all kids have the time to be on a team or just because it feels great to ride. So why isn't it offered in gym class? The goal of gym class is to teach adolescents a healthy lifestyle by offering them many sports to try, and skating falls under that list perfectly. By giving students a chance to skate, it may show them a new activity to enjoy and stay healthy by doing it. 
There are over 300 state parks in America, and it would be easy for schools and students to access them. If a school does not have a skate park nearby, any paved parking lot would do just as well. Skating has taught me to be brave and has given me more energy and strength, has taught me to be much more stable than before, has kept me healthy, and I have had a lot of fun doing it. This isn't an urgent measure. <laughs> this was just an excerpt. So let me point a couple of things out. This paper has a lot going for it. The claim, the main claim, is that skateboarding should be part of the PE cl curriculum. There's some good reasoning showing up in this paper. The writer notes all the things that make skateboarding attractive to kids and what it does to make them healthy and the skills it requires. The evidence comes from both personal experience and from Skateboard America. There's citation here and there's data. So I, this is Mary Ann, and I want to point out that this student from St. Joseph, Missouri can do something that's pretty sophisticated in writing an argument since we also want to think about other conventions and writing argument. And that is he knows how to acknowledge a possible argument to his argument. So his first acknowledgement is that skateboarding is not number one issue in the world considering everything else that's going on. And he also acknowledges, he anticipates that argument, well, what if there isn't a place on a school campus for skateboarding? So he says, well, if you don't have a skate park nearby, you, can, you could work in a parking lot. And I think this is something we would want to build on since he already has the idea whether he knows it or not. Um, you know, he might try some more counter arguments. How safe is skateboarding? Would we want parent permission letters? You know, how do we buy equipment? But the fact is, he's got the idea, so we want to build on that. And then what I loved about this is he already has an argumentative strategy, and that is, he says, a rhetorical question, so why isn't it offered in gym class if it's so great? Um, and so this is a strategy we probably want to point out to him so he knows he's doing and it wasn't just some happy accident so he and other students could repeat it. So there's so much to admire in this piece um, that we're imagining is just an excerpt because it ends so abruptly. Um, and Judy, you might comment on some things that a teacher might want to take this draft and do more with. Yeah, there's just a couple quick comments. Um, I enjoyed the piece too, and, but as a teacher you might tell your student, oh, you know what, you need to maybe more fully develop the evidence or put it in separate paragraphs. The paper doesn't really have a call to action, so we might have a conversation of what that might be, look like, maybe um, writing a letter to the school board um, or something of that nature. I think, this is Marianne, that one of the main points we want to make here is that there are conventions that we want students to learn about argument, but there aren't recipes for writing argument. For example, you really don't actually have to have a counter argument. Um, there aren't formulas for writing argument. To us, the CAP project provides an ideal situation for students to keep practicing this kind of writing and for doing it for real purposes and real audiences. Um, and I want to say another beauty of the CAP project, and that is that reading serves a real world purpose. When students go online, for example, they're searching for information that they're actually going to use in their civic actions. They're not just reading because the teacher assigned reading. They're reading with a do something in mind. They're going to use their reading to call attention to a real problem. And we're going to ask Judy to give us an example of reading and writing with a do something in mind. And reading and writing when it happens for real world purposes. A typical reading writing day during a CAP project. Um, well, for the first thing I'll say is that, it, of course, it's collaborative, that students get in their teams. Um, I've given them some sort of task to do. I'll say, hey, you guys, today we're going to focus on um, writing, doing our thinking it through. Um, we'll talk about what that looks like. And they will get in their groups and huddle and, and figure out what it is that they need to do. They might compare their research in order to figure out their goals. They might discuss their civic actions. 
Um, in the computer lab, they huddle. I'm on roller skates, running all around, trying to help them, reminding them that it's got a connect policy. Um, and they're, they're really helping each other. And the beauty is, is it's a topic they picked. So they're genuinely interested, and they, it's like a, uh, they're being detectives, and they're trying to find information and get to the bottom of it. Um, they all, obviously, when they get all their surveys together or they get the results of um, some sort of interview, then they compile it. What does it mean? Um, what should we do next? For example, one of the uh, things that kids were working on last year was the bus, well, a bus was coming by to pick up students for coming to school, and the bus would be so crowded it would leave a bunch of students left at the bus stop. So I had students pick that as their project because they wanted to. It directly affected them. And they um, interviewed the bus driver. But they really worked ahead of time on what, what are the right questions for the bus driver. Checking in, this, what this looks like in my classroom is pretty straightforward. I say, hey, you know, we're still focused on the Bill of Rights today, but I'm going to give you 20 minutes to check in, fit together, make sure you're on task, look at your tracking sheet, um, who's doing what, that sort of thing. And then lastly, of course, is all the writing. Um, like I said before, it's so collaborative. It's so wonderful walking around. And, and again, I feel like I'm talking to my peers because they're passionately talking about these some of very sophisticated topics. Um, so Sandy's going to talk a little bit now about the day that I've been talking about. Well, let me say this. Um, we suggest in our book that writing about reading is a limited pursuit. Because no 14-year-old can write anything about his or her reading for class that the teacher doesn't already know. And in many cases, that can't be found somewhere already on the internet. But in contrast, doing something with the reading connects purpose and audience and content in a way that engages students and, we hope, gives them an authoritative voice. They are the experts in their project. As we said, that's one thing we love about the CAT project. Students are doing something with their reading and writing. Another thing we love about the CAT project is that it lines up so nicely with the, the kind of um, philosophy behind the Common Core State Standards that calls for integration of reading and writing and speaking and listening. In the day that Judy described, Students are doing something with their reading and writing. And in fact, they're doing four things at the same time. They are reading, writing, speaking, and listening almost simultaneously. And that's this underlying principle of the common core, that we connect those four language activities and make them help them work together um, for the students. The CAP project has yet another huge advantage. Um, while there will always be some writing for the teacher, this kind of a project invites students to write for and to multiple audiences, many of them outside the school walls. And Judy's going to give us a few examples. Sure. I'm, I'm going to talk about um, the list here, but not go into great detail of, about each audience that's mentioned. I, I want to talk a little bit about community members, administrators, and elected officials. I noticed one of the questions, and I had the same problem, was who do I contact for you know, some problem? And they, they immediately want to contact uh, the person mentioned, President Obama, or in the cases I'm thinking of, um, they want to contact the um, superintendent before they kind of go through the layers of who's between the superintendent. For example, having eco-friendly bathrooms. Um, students wanted to write the superintendent right away. So um, one of the things that we do, and this is sort of a side note, is we do um, layers of government. We talk about the different layers of government, and I give them scenarios, and I say, is it a local issue, a global issue, a city or state issue, and then who would you contact? And so we're in the computer lab trying to figure out who's the right audience for the problem. Sometimes it might be a community member, like I mentioned the bus driver, or a, na uh, a nature center person, or the person in charge of wa water policy. But it is challenging to figure out who the right audience is. And it definitely takes um, some uh, extra work. Um, the inter administrators are great audiences for CAP because students often interview the principal or the vice principal, you know, especially about bullying or dropping out. And then, of course, elected officials, like I mentioned before. Students, um, you know, really it ups the stakes when they're writing a letter to an elected official. Um, hopefully they've got the right one, as I mentioned before. But they really do much more formal writing. And sometimes we have to work on the quality of it 
but it's wonderful to have such different audiences for their writing. What other audiences do your students write for? Can you guys put on the chat some of the different audiences that you've included? Someone asked if we, um, my students ever mail the letters. Um, it's all been through email. That's what we've done. Is, yeah, they have to write it ahead of time, and then they usually cut and paste it. Book authors. Local <laughs> newspaper. Oh, you, these are great lists. Interest groups, nice. Book authors. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they write to their parents. Wow, this is really helpful. <laughs> I'm right in the middle of it. Uh, great ideas. I think what we want to do at this point, actually. Could I, could I suggest, when I'm looking at, this is Marianne, when I'm looking at all these fantastic audiences, real world audiences, authentic audiences, I just am curious, Judy, what kind of responses do you get from audiences? And should we expect all these audiences to respond? Great and question. Other people might want to weigh in on that as we talk about it for a minute. Great question. So do the audiences respond? Um, it totally varies. Sometimes, it, you know, of course, in, let, in writing, sometimes they do get a response. But I, I somewhat tell them that, you know, to do the civic action, to count it as a 100% civic action, it, you don't have to get a response. What you do is you need to make, you know, make your claim. What's the evidence? What, what do you want them to do? What's your call to action? Um, and hopefully you will hear back. I mean, certainly when it's in person, that's different. But sometimes they hear back. Anybody else get, get uh, responses back to their students' efforts? That actually does remind me. We did, uh, Eric Swalwell did a, a YouTube video responding to letters from my students, which was great uh, and unexpected. We're going to go to the next part. Um, what we want to do is um, show you a um, PSA, a public service announcement, done by students. Uh, it starts with no sound, actually, so don't, uh, there's nothing wrong with your sound. Um, and you can see the title, Stop Drunk Driving and Save Lives. And, and then we want to talk about it. Um, it's definitely an opportunity to, to have a different medium for um, doing arguments.
Okay, this is Marianne. This is probably the tenth time I've looked at this video, and every time to me it is so powerful um, and emotional. Um, we want to look at it through four different lenses, and um, the first is what the claims are. And so you can weigh in on what you think the claims are. I'm going to say that I found the claim in the visual images, the claim that drunk driving kills people, and in this case, the visual images are both the claim and part of the evidence, and I found the claim in the title, and um, you saw that title on the PowerPoint, Stop Drunk Driving and Save Lives. Um, <clears throat> this is Judy. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of evidence that gave um, to, to show what was going on. There were facts about fatalities and drinking. Uh, they personalized it. They uh, did a lot of attention-grabbing photos and news headlines. Um, they made it, you know, about the fact that this could be you. Um, so there was there are many examples of different types of evidence that they did in the PSA. Um, so this is Sandy, and I, I took a pretty close look at the calls to action, and I was <laughs> I was amazed. These students actually have, I counted them, at least nine calls to action. And they range from IDing everyone to going on Facebook and tweeting. I particularly like the way their, their calls to action to the audience who would contact, they range from the audience who would contact a senator to an audience who would use social media. Just, just listen to, to them while I read them. And I think you'll sort of see how the audience shifts with, with each of these calls to action. Join your school's chapter of SAD, okay, that's students. Enforce the law, that's police. ID everyone, that's police, but also maybe re retailers. Um, don't sell alcohol to anyone under 21. Don't provide alcohol to minors. That could be to parents, because sometimes parents provide alcohol to mi minors. Send your legislature a letter telling them how drunk driving must be stopped. Don't get a DUI. Tell your friends on Facebook and send your friends tweets. I, I really like this because it shows that these kids are really paying attention to their potential audiences, to the people who might see their video. Now the last thing we want to look at is uh, the question, what difference do a real audience and purpose make. Judy, what do you think? It certainly, uh, uh, I think, increases student engagement. I think, this is Marianne, I think a real audience and purpose are completely motivating. Um, and then we ask you in a little chat, what difference does a real audience and purpose make in, in your classroom? Well, I've seen some, some great comments here. Um, that students feel like they're accomplishing something and that it matters. Uh, they're self-motivating. They're not um, doing it just to get a grade or just because it's an assignment in a classroom. They really care about it. Um, it gives them a, a true focus point. It keeps the students more focused and they buy into the assignment. And Melody says a real audience gives the students an opportunity to think about themselves and how it connects to them. This is really helping kids become citizens of our society. Um, I think that these are, are this, this again is a wonderful list of some of the benefits of this kind of assignment where students really um, are actually writing to real people to do something with their work. So we're going to leave you. This is Marianne. We're going to um, leave you with some student writing. Um, it's a way for us to underline the value of the CAP project one more time and to reemphasize why we included it in our book. This student, this is one of Judy Kennedy's students, Josephine Luma, and this is her reflective writing about how she grew as a compassionate citizen through CAP. Some skills, by the way, this is in the book. I just absolutely love this reflection. Some skills that I gained after this experience were open-mindedness. I now know that not everyone is going to feel the same way as I do, 
I also learned how to communicate well with others and how to be more professional with the things I say or do. I also gained a voice. I know now that I'm not the only one who wants to be heard. There are many people who want change just as bad as I do. My attitude changed dramatically through this experience. At first I thought that no one really cares and no one was going to give us the time of day. But now I know that I was completely wrong. People do actually care and do want to hear what we have to say. By doing little things like these civic actions, I do believe that it is possible to make change in our society. We have time uh, for a few questions and answers if, um, if you're interested in doing that. Uh, Terry wrote, for instance, how do kids go through this project? What are the... the well, right now my that? students are, are um, in the thinking it through and then they'll start their civic actions uh, and they're talking about whether they want to do interviews or surveys first, um, whether they want to go to a school board meeting, when all that happens. Of course, they know that they choose a civic action and they do it and that's the results are supposed to inform them on the next civic action that they're to do. Um, there are so many choices of different types of civic actions, so it's kind of fun for them to think they're going to do one thing, and then after they get the results of the first thing, they change their mind and do something else, like writing letters, et cetera. Carrie, maybe you can pick some questions for us? Sure. I'll just add to what Judy just said. If, if the question is around the process of CAP, CAP provides what we call the CAP planner. And that's what Judy was just ref referencing. So the students are guided through the process by first they have to propose an issue that they want to work on to the teacher. And the document is called proposal. And so the students uh, propose the issue that they want to work on, why they think that issue is worthy of a long-term CAP pro project. They try to use persuasive writing to convince the teacher that this is the issue, this is the great issue. And the teacher either approves or, or says, no, nah, think about it some more. Then once approved, then the students do the form called thinking it through. This requires the students to really start to analyze causes and effects and drill down on that policy connection between uh, their problem and some kind of connection with public policy. It also advises the students that they're going to be collecting sources through this whole process. So it kind of comes back to now we're going to help the students get a little more serious about making claims that are backed with evidence. And then the third form is called civic action. And the students use that form repeatedly. Um, usually teachers require four or five civic actions in the course of a semester. And that is where students uh, propose what action they want to take the rationale for taking that action and what they expect might happen. And they also reflect on the last uh, civic action that they took. They hand that in to the teacher and the teacher tells them, yes, go forward or let's talk about it. And then the final form is called um, the CAP report. And the report is where the students do the reflection on what they learned, what knowledge, skills, and civic dispositions they gathered out of the process. There was a question, and, and Laura has written a little bit about it, too, about group size. Um, typically in my classroom, I, I um, really encourage them to do, I tell them two to five people, uh, and encourage them to um, do more than two if possible, because then it's more work for them. But as long as they understand that and they want to work together, that works for me. And of course, I don't want more than five, because we do do five civic actions and I ask each kid to really own one, sort of be the name on it. That doesn't mean that kid um, has to do all the work, um, but it does mean that kid is, that student is responsible for doing the work. So uh, five work, of course, uh, in, in the end, it might also have to do with how big your class is, too. I have one group of six. CAP is, you know, our thinking about CAP when we developed it, and this is why I love what, what Sandy and Judy and Marianne are talking about is that it's really supposed to be authentic learning. And so it's about, you know, how do we as people in the United States, in this democracy, go about trying to solve a problem? And I, our belief at CRF is that every single person 
needs and deserves the opportunity to develop the skills to be able to solve problems in our daily lives that aren't just our own problems, but are perhaps on our streets, in our communities, or, or beyond. And so, you know, we really hope that this program provides those opportunities, you know, in a simple way. It, it, it sounds more complicated than it is. There's some lessons, you do the lessons, and then all through the process, you know, the students are going to be communicating their thoughts, communicating about their issues, and it is going to be a lot of writing. And that's what I think is so key about Uncommonly Good Ideas in this book. It really is opening our minds to the fact that there is a range of writing. You know, the Common Core does not have to be scary. Terry, I want to add one more comment on what you said. I, the thing I love about CAP is I think it really teaches kids that they have tremendous power. And they just, you know, they can learn how to, they can learn about something that's important to them and then together present their case. Uh, and they have a voice. And it's really important. And I think that it gets lost sometimes and CAP provides a wonderful opportunity. This is Marianne. Um, Terry Franzi, I think that's how I pronounce your name, says that sometimes students think that writing, reflective writing, is fluff. Um, and I think it's really integral to any kind of learning, and especially to the CAP project. We know a person in the English language arts field, Donald Graves, who said that um, reflecting on an activity is actually more important than the activity itself in terms of learning. So this student really, when she wrote her reflective piece, she kind of realized all all the things that she had learned, and the writing brought that out. So you are right, Terry. It's not fluff. It's really analysis and um, getting to the heart of the matter. Well, this is Sandy. Maybe I'll, I'll make um, one more comment. About, um, one thing we've tried to do here, and Marianne mentioned it, is that there aren't um, one or two recipes for argument, or there aren't one or two recipes for informational writing, I think um, sometimes it tends to happen that, that uh, people create formulas because that's a step on the way for students in development. But the danger in formulas is that students can get stuck in them. And um, what the Common Core was all about was trying to broaden our ideas about all the different kinds of writing that students will have to do in the future and to begin thinking together about ways that we can create lessons that will help them learn how to read a situation and go in and know how to adapt their writing to a, a particular audience and purpose. And these kinds of more um, analytical skills will help them in business and later in life. And so the richness of this CAP curriculum is one of the reasons why we wanted to write about it in the book, because it's an example of how that broadening can happen. Carrie, this is Marianne. Thank you for asking about the book. I don't know if Carrie has a link, but you can um, get it at NWP. For, that's for nationalwritingproject.org. I want to thank Marianne and Sandy and Judy uh, for joining us. This was just such a great experience. I learned a lot. I hope that all of you who, are, who participated did too. If you have questions or if you want to share some writing with us, by all means, please email me. That's my email, k-e-r-i at crf-usa.org. And I will send it on to the authors and to Judy. And um, if we could clap, applause would be awesome. So we'll just clap in here, and hopefully you can hear us. <laughs> and thank you again, um, Judy and Sandy and Marianne. We really appreciate all your help with this.